This is the belly fat no one wants, but most people have. But this is just one type of belly fat. While everyone focuses on what they see, there's a hidden layer of belly fat called visceral fat. It can not only make your gut look bloated, but it wraps around your organs, pumping out inflammatory molecules linked to heart disease and even early death. Now you might be like, well, Jeremy, if it's so bad, I'll just zap it with liposuction. Nope, not even a surgeon can get to it, but you can. Visceral fat is actually easier to get rid of. With the right plan, you can see and feel it decreasing in just 30 days. Just like my brother-in-law, Dayton. The funny thing about Dayton is everything on him is small, except his belly. He's actually not overly fat anywhere else. So it was surprising when his DEXA scan clocked him at 33% body fat. But with 1200 grams of visceral fat hiding deep in his gut, it makes sense. That's far higher than what Kevin has, even though he's at 38% body fat. And that's 50 times more than what I have. But after he followed the plan I'll share with you today, his gut quickly tightened up. And after just 10 weeks, his visceral fat dropped down by 50%. So with normal belly fat, there's no foods that increase it directly. It's all about how many calories you consume. But that's not necessarily the case with visceral fat. If two people ate the exact same amount of calories, one of them could store way more visceral belly fat than the other because of certain foods they're eating. In a 2014 experiment, scientists put this to the test. They took 39 healthy adults and split them into two groups. The researchers overfed each group with an extra 750 calories a day from muffins. But in group one, the muffins were made using polyunsaturated fat. This is the fat you find in foods like fish, nuts, and seeds. Whereas the muffins fed to group two were made using saturated fat. This fat you find in butter and fatty meats. After seven weeks of eating these muffins, both groups gained the same amount of weight. But group two, the one that ate saturated fats, they gained double the amount of visceral belly fat compared to group one. In fact, group one didn't just gain less fat, they actually ended up building a little more lean mass as well. But exactly how much saturated fat is too much? And what should you eat instead? Well, most sources suggest keeping your saturated fat intake to less than about 20 to 30 grams per day, the equivalent to this much butter. And when we scanned Dayton's favorite ribeye steak dinner with our Built With Science Plus app that I got him to start tracking his diet with, it contained almost 50 grams of fat, with almost half of it being saturated. And don't forget, that's just one of his meals. With his breakfast and lunch, some days he was consuming over 50 grams of saturated fat. But this doesn't mean that you should completely cut out these foods. Just balance them out with more unsaturated fats. So instead of having really fatty meat like ribeye every day, now Dayton just has it once or twice a week. He also balances it out with fatty fish, which are loaded with more unsaturated fats and chooses leaner cuts of meats when he can. Swapping ribeye steak for top sirloin steak already drops the saturated fat intake by 15 grams. It's also worth noting that grass-fed meats tend to be lower in saturated fats and higher in the unsaturated fats that we do want, but they are far more expensive and the difference is honestly quite small. For more realistic swaps, here's a list of the biggest culprits for saturated fats, as well as a list of the best foods you want most of your daily fats to come from. But here's where food choices gets even more important. Some people seem to be genetically more likely to store visceral fat, especially those of Asian, Indian, or Hispanic descent. But is that really just genetics? Or could it just be their cultural diets are usually higher in the next foods that's been shown to increase visceral belly fat? I honestly didn't realize this, but many Asian dishes I loved are actually packed with added sugar. One rock sugar. Two tablespoons of sugar. Sugar. The sugar. Sugar. Brown sugar. Not to mention everyone's favorite bubble tea contains up to 50 grams of it. And over 30% of the Taiwanese people consume something like this at least once a day. But what's so bad about added sugar? Well, added sugar is actually made up of two different types of sugar, glucose and fructose. And back in 2009, scientists wanted to find out if one of these types of sugar contributes more to visceral belly fat. So they had people drink the exact same amount of calories but from a drink that was sweetened with either pure fructose or pure glucose. After 10 weeks, only the fructose group significantly increased their visceral belly fat. On top of that, the fructose group's insulin sensitivity also worsened, meaning their bodies now had a harder time handling carbs. 
Now, when you hear fructose, you might think of fruit. And you're right, fruit does contain fructose. But fruit also comes with fiber and water, so it's incredibly hard to overeat, especially at the amounts you'd need to for it to start affecting your visceral fat. But table sugar and high fructose corn syrup, those are the real culprits. And foods you might not even expect are loaded with them. Not just bubble tea, cereal, granola, sweetened yogurt, juice, jam, and even condiments like ketchup. But rather than eliminating these foods altogether, a much better approach is to just replace some of them with a food that can decrease visceral fat, not increase it. Protein. Back in 2005, scientists took a group of people and didn't instruct them to do anything aside from double their current protein intake. Surprisingly, again, despite not being instructed to eat less or change anything else, they naturally began eating fewer calories and over 12 weeks lost over 10 pounds, with almost all of it being pure fat. While the study didn't measure visceral fat directly, the large reductions in total fat mass combined with the appetite suppressing effects of protein, they create the ideal conditions for reducing visceral fat. Wait, 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 wait. Before you go dumping out grandma's cookie jar and filling it with chicken breast, there's easier ways to swap sugar for protein without actually changing much. For example, my mom is a doctor, and even though she knows better, she could not break her habit of loading her morning coffee with cream and two heaping spoonfuls of sugar. So I replaced her sugar stash with my French vanilla built with size protein powder. And now she mixes half a scoop of it with a little bit of milk and pours that in her coffee. And each month, instead of consuming 750 grams of sugar plus 45 grams of saturated fat from her cream, she's getting an extra 450 grams of protein. Whereas Dayton's culprit was Chicago mixed popcorn. Made with real cheese, butter, and 100% whole grain. Yeah, that I, I this like. Is caramel and these yeah. sound these sound fire. So I got him a bag of plain microwavable popcorn, topped it with a mix of our built with science salted caramel protein, sugar-free syrup, and cheddar seasoning. Pop that in the freezer for 10 minutes, and bam, cuts out 20 grams of sugar and replaces it with 29 grams of protein. It's good. The flavor is like pretty spot on. Yeah. But popcorn is just the beginning. Here's some more ways you can easily replace sugar with protein. And here's how you can actually apply all of this into a full day of eating. Now this is just the diet part of the full 30 day plan I'll show you later on. But while this meal plan can help prevent you from gaining more visceral fat, it's actually not gonna do much to get rid of it if you're still eating too many calories overall. The good news though, is that as soon as you get into a calorie deficit, visceral belly fat is typically the first fat that your body mobilizes for energy. And the crazy part is, this can happen even if you're still eating a bunch of saturated fat and sugar, although I wouldn't recommend it. It's why research has shown that even just losing 10 pounds can shrink visceral fat by as much as 30%, which is the closest thing to spot reduction as it gets. But how many calories you should eat will differ from everyone else. For example, my fitness app discovered that I see the best fat loss results eating around 2,300 calories per day. Whereas for Dayton, it noticed he has to go a little bit lower. It'll continue adjusting his calories as it goes, so stay tuned because I'll be documenting every step of his transformation and releasing the future video. But although a calorie deficit is going to be the most effective tool to burn off visceral fat, there is still one more strategy that's been shown to decrease it even if you're not in a calorie deficit and even if you don't lose any weight. So you know how everyone tries to target their belly fat with special exercise? Well, unfortunately, it doesn't seem like that's possible. But visceral belly fat might be different. Researchers noticed this back in 2023, where they conducted one of the largest studies to ever look at how cardio affects visceral fat. First, they found that all types of exercise were great for reducing visceral fat. But when they took a closer look at the data, they noticed two types of exercise that rose above the rest, moderate to high intensity cardio and interval training. Unlike your stubborn love handles just lounging under your skin, visceral fat seems to actually listen when your body sends in the fat mobilizing hormone known as catecholamines, which spikes during higher intensity exercise. Now, while this might make it seem like you need to kill yourself with endless all out sprints, that's actually not the case. The exercise required to torch visceral fat based on this study required getting above 75% of your max heart rate. It's not a walk in the park, but it's far from an all-out sprint. Even better, these types of workouts are quick. If you do them right, 
even just short 15 to 25 minute interval cardio sessions done two to three times per week is enough to make a measurable dent. Here's how to do them. For each interval session, pick an exercise you can go pretty hard at. One paper did find that running could be slightly more effective than cycling at reducing visceral fat, but there were too many limitations for it to be meaningful. I personally enjoy sprints, especially when it's nice out, but I found that cycling, rowing, or even the elliptical are much easier to recover from. Spend five minutes warming up, and then when you're ready, go hard for 30 seconds. It doesn't have to be all out, but you should be breathing hard enough that you'd have a hard time holding the conversation. Then slow it down and recover for 90 seconds. You want to repeat that for six to 10 rounds. But the downside with interval training is it's tough and it takes time to recover from, so you can't do it very often. And what seems to be the most important for reducing visceral fat is how much exercise you do in total, rather than just how hard you go. Which is why, especially on your off days, set a walking goal of at least 8,000 steps. It's low impact, easy to stick to, and still helps you chip away at your visceral fat over time. Here's an example of what this could look like for the next 30 days. Dayton's already seen impressive results by applying this. And with our Bitwell Science Plus app, he was able to easily track his nutrition and get personalized workouts every week to guide him every step of the way. And you can try it too for two weeks free by either scanning this code right here or heading to builtwithscience.com, which I'll also link below. But while what I shared with you today can help tighten up your midsection, to get abs that actually pop, I would highly recommend adding two exercises. And you can check out this video next to see what they are. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you there.